Amen. Let's give that praise right back up to Jesus. How many is thankful for a good God that we serve? Amen, amen. So it's so good to be in the house today. Uh-oh, my tablet's acting weird. I'm going to have to just preach this from my memory. There we go. I got it working. I got it working. Don't worry. We won't be here three hours. Man, it's so good to be in God's house, uh, be in God's presence. You know, let's give it up for all the volunteers. Man, these people show up hours before you get here every week. And show up, get things ready for the service today. So we couldn't do this without you. And didn't Pastor Brian look so cool up there with his little pop collar on his blue jean jacket? I like that. It looks good on him. Uh, you have some amazing pastors. I love them. They're, they are great friends to me, and they're good people. Good people. They love God, love God's church, and love his people. And you have some amazing pastors in this house. Amen. Well, it's been a minute, and it's good to be back in Texas. It's supposed to be a little warmer. I thought, you know, it's always, every time I come here, even though I know that you're in the panhandle, it's way up here in the top in my brain. I'm from Ohio, so I came when it was like 10 degrees of weather when I left. I'm like, I'm going to go somewhere it's warmer. No, it's cold. I got to wear a jacket. It's okay, though. I'm glad to be here. Uh, why don't you look at somebody and say, it's so good to see you. Say, if you were any, look, look, just look at them right now on your face. Say, if you were any better looking. Now watch it. If it ain't your wife, you better hold on. Say, say if, you, if you were any better looking, you'd be as good looking as me. Sometimes you just got to talk to yourself, right? Man, we celebrate. Super Bowl was last week. Anybody watch the Super Bowl last week? Uh, any, any, did we have any Chief fans in the room or anybody that kind of leaned towards? Any, any Eagles fans? Same exact reaction the first service. It's funny, Up where I live in Ohio, there's a lot of Eagles fans, but I read a, I read a story the other uh, day about a Chiefs fan that, a uh, huge football fan, loves football in general, and, and he bought Super Bowl tickets way, like half a year before it even happened. They didn't know that the Chiefs were even going to be playing, and he went in and bought the Super Bowl tickets because he was going to go, and, and he spent two or $3,000 on these tickets. Well, what he didn't realize is that it, they scheduled the Super Bowl on the day he's supposed to get married. And he was freaking out, like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, I already spent two or $3,000. I love football, but it's our wedding day. What am I going to do? So he decided to put it up on a Facebook ad to see who can take his place. And, and he, he posted it up how much he wanted for him and, or what, what, what he was going to do. You know, he wanted to make sure somebody can take his place for that day. And so he goes and he says, if you, uh, if you can, meet me. At this date, at 3 p.m., at the First Baptist Church, and her name is Tiffany. That's a bad joke. Don't laugh at that joke. If you're by your wife, don't laugh. Today, I want to speak to you out of the second, uh, second Timothy, chapter 1. I want to speak to you a message that I entitled, Stir It Up. Somebody say, Stir It Up. Are you all ready to preach with me today? Amen. All right, that's what I need. Because if y'all don't help me preach, I just stay on one point forever until you go, yeah, and then I move on. That's just the way I work. That's just how it happens for me. So I'm giving you the, the right to just help me preach, all right? All right. Y'all feel good? Y'all feel nervous? Y'all act nervous. I'm the one with the microphone. Y'all act nervous in the room today. We're going to have a good time. Amen. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1. But before I give you the, the verse that we're really, the verses that we're going to really concentrate on, I want to give you a little context because I think context is important. I think it's important to understand who's talking, why they're saying what they're saying, and who are they talking to. And in 2 Timothy, these are the words of Paul. Paul is specifically writing to Timothy, one of his spiritual sons. It's a person that more than likely his family got saved under Paul's ministry, and he seen something in Timothy and began to mentor him and nurture him, and yet and here he writes the second book of Timothy. The first one's a little earlier on in the, in the Bible, and that's when he wrote, actually he was in prison when he wrote the first book of Timothy, and here he is in prison writing the second book of Timothy. The first time he wrote in prison in Rome, he wrote actually 1 Timothy and Titus, which is another person that was someone he mentored and one he would call a spiritual son in the Lord. Paul gets out of prison that first time and is, for the most part, pretty free to, to do what he wants until 
Emperor Nero, if you're ever familiar with Emperor Nero, if you've ever read anything about him, he's one of the most cruel men in history, especially towards Christians. And here Nero winds up putting Paul back into prison. And while he's in prison, he writes the second book of Timothy. It's an important book. I think that there's so much in it. And the reason why I believe it is, see, Timothy was the pastor of the, F, of the church of Ephesus, Ephesus church. And, and he was the point person for Timothy for that church. And you can sense this a little bit. It doesn't give us all the details in, in Scripture, but when you read it in context of what he's saying and why he's saying it, you can tell there's a little pressure being put on Timothy. There's pressure from the culture around. There's some persecution going on. And, and you can tell that Timothy, by the way Paul instructs him, that he's kind of stepped backwards in his faith or in his calling or in what he's supposed to be doing as the pastor of this church. And Paul writes this sitting in a prison. This is a prison called the Mamertine uh, Time Prison that you can actually visit. Pastor Brian uh, called me this morning. He was in Jerusalem. It's pretty neat when you like tell me some of the things that he was going, seeing and things that they were experiencing. And, and you can actually go into Rome and you can actually go to this very prison that Paul was thrown in. It, it's not much more than a big, large hole underneath the municipal building. It's a big, just carved out cell in the ground with a little passway on the top where they can hand food through it or maybe even yell out to them, whatever. And that's where Paul is sitting, writing this book, writing these instructions, writing this perspective that he's trying to give to Timothy. And you can tell when he's writing it that it's very important. One reason is important. This is the last book that we have that Paul wrote, the words that he instructed. It's the last thing we have because shortly after, this same emperor Nero executes Paul. And you can see that in his writings so much that you can sense the urgency and the passion that this was written from a man that was a, knew that he was about to die. It wasn't like getting in prison the first time when he wrote 1 Timothy because he got out. This time Paul recognizes this is the end of the road for him. This is all that he can do and all that God has asked him to do. And he writes this with such an urgency. Paul actually uses certain uh, phrasing that would be familiar for someone that understood the Old Testament and New Testament and even the words of Jesus and about describing the Spirit of God. You know, if you're not familiar, the Old Testament and the New Testament and Jesus talk specifically as, as an analogy or an allegory or even as an example that the Spirit of God is like this. One of the ways that the Scripture says that the Spirit of God, it's like wind. It's like wind. John 3 verse 8 says, it blows and no one knows which way that it goes. It goes from here or there. Nobody knows where it starts or where it is. The Spirit of God is like wind and it blows everywhere. Another way is, example is what that the Spirit of God is like. It's like fire. Exodus chapter 3, 13 talks about how it was the fire that led the children of Israel at night and guided them through the wilderness. Anybody familiar with those passages? That the Spirit of God was literally like fire. Even when Moses was given his, his calling, his, his decree to what he's supposed to do, it was in a fiery bush reaching out and calling out to him the Spirit of God. He even talks about in Acts chapter 2, when the church was first birthed, it said that it rested on them like tongues of Fire. The Spirit of God is like wind. It's like fire. Another way it's like, it's like water. It's like water. John 7, Jesus tells us a couple of times, he says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Matter of fact, he said that if this water I'm talking about, if you drink out of that well, it's going to make you thirsty again. But with the water I'm going to give you, you'll never thirst again. you never long for knowing who you are and your purpose. The Spirit of God is like water. And Paul uses this type of verbiage to Timothy when he starts talking to him. And just right here in the first few verses of the first chapter that I want to point out. Are you all with me still? 
Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 6 through 7. I thank God, Paul, talking whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. And without ceasing, I remember you, Timothy, because I'm in prison. I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call into remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, dwelt with first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift, which is in you through the laying on of the hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and a sound mind. Maybe your translation says it this way, like the ESV version. It says, for I remind you to fan into flame. So Paul here specifically is speaking on what would be considered like an ember in a fire. That he's telling Timothy that you got some embers in you, and we need to stir those things up. Fan them into flame. Let's stir them up. I mean, like camping, you know what I'm talking about. You build a campfire and it can blaze really tall to the point you got to step back. You got to move your chair back a little bit because it's burning your eyebrows off a little bit, right? And then over time, though, it will just die down. And here's the thing you can leave it sit all night long. But if you get up in the morning, you see smoke because where there's smoke, there's fire. And Paul's giving him this analogy, this picture Timothy. Fan into flame. Stir up those embers inside of you, those embers inside of you. I believe when we look at these few verses, Paul gives us a pattern for you and I, just as much as he's given it to Timothy, how we can stir up the gift in us. Stir up the gift in us. Somebody say stir it up. The first point I want to point out First idea that I want you to see here that Paul is saying is that you first have to recognize. You have to recognize. Recognize what? Timothy, it's in you. You have to recognize, Timothy, this thing that you need is already in you. Matter of fact, it wasn't just in you. It was in your grandma. And it was in your mama, and I'm pretty sure, Timothy, it's right where it needs to be in you. Let me stop just for a moment. Is there anybody thankful, and I can preach, but is there anybody thankful for some praying mamas in your life? I mean, I'm thankful. I'm a product of this on this stage today because I had a praying grandmother that believed in the ministry that was in me and a mama that believed in the ministry that was in me. I'm part of that product of them believing for me, believing with me that it was in me already when I couldn't see it in myself. How many is thankful for some praying mamas? Matter of fact, if there's some men in the room can even say, I'm a better man and I'm a better husband because I had a praying grandma that wouldn't give up on me. Anybody in the room? Come on, somebody. I just got to give some credit where credit's due. It was in you. Paul's telling Timothy here, Timothy, I know you're looking for it to change out here. I know you're thinking that there's something you need that's probably in this. I know it might be, well, I need this kind of job or this kind of education or this kind of thing. But, Timothy, I need you to understand something, son. It is already in you. You need to recognize it. You need to recognize it. Come on, look at somebody just with some attitude and say, you better recognize. See, everything that God has, hear me out, everything that God has called you to do, he's already put inside of you to do it. Everything. He's called, oh, I, I know I feel it in the room. I feel some of you are like, no, no, you don't know my situation. Everything he has called you to do in this life, he has already deposited it inside of you to do it. Jesus said it this way. He said, the kingdom of God is not here or there. It's not in a building. The kingdom of God is not in a denomination. The kingdom of God is not in some type of program. But the kingdom of God rests inside of you. Everything that you need, Timothy, it's in you. 
Recognize it. Do you want to stir up the embers of your life? You want to stir up the gifts that God has inside of you? You've got to recognize it's not in your situation changing. It's not in someone giving you this or someone giving you that. That it's already deposited in you, and you have to recognize it is there despite how you feel. Something we must recognize. Here's the thing. It can be so hard. Aaron, it can be so hard to recognize what's in us when we are distracted by our circumstances. It's almost like we get spiritual amnesia. I mean, I'm preaching to myself for that. Sometimes when things come out of nowhere and the world swings hard and it hits you right in the gut where you weren't expecting it, it, the first thing you say is like, what's happened? What, What am I supposed to do? What, 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 what? How, how does this change? How, God, what are, what are we, is anybody else like that? Like, I got to figure out what can I do. And it's so easy in the distraction to forget that God has already put it inside, everything you need inside of you to even get through that circumstance, to even handle it and come out on the other side. The world wants to tell us, no, you can't. You need therapy. You need this. And I'm all for those things. I think they're good. They're good tools to use to the help. But the reality of it is, if somebody will not convince in their mind that God has put something valuable inside of them, it is going to be very, very hard for anything to change in their life. And you first have to recognize it is in you. whatever we need. I know, Timothy, that you're going through a lot. Timothy, I'm writing to you to encourage you while I'm sitting on death row. And I'm telling you it's in you. It's something God has given you. You ain't even, even got to be good to get it. God's going to deposit it. In he, he, that's why he said, and every man is given a, a measure of faith. He's given you everything that you need. All you have to do is activate it. It's in you. There's a calling in every one of us. You know, maybe that, that word's very unfamiliar to you, calling. Maybe you're not used to that. Well, I don't, every one of us has a calling in this room. And do you know why they call it a calling? Do you know why you call it a calling? Because whatever is inside of you, when you get around people that need what is inside of you, they begin to call out for it, and it begins to rise up in you. And every one of us in this room today has a calling inside of us that God has put in you. And when you get around the right people that need what you got, they begin to call out to the very need that they're calling for. And it's the very, you have the very antidote to what they need. That's why it's called a calling. We all have a calling. When you get around the right people, it calls out for what's inside of you. Maybe that's why you're always a person that just needs a, an encourage. you're an encourager. You know, you ever met somebody just, man, they always encourage me when I'm around them. When I'm filled with the discouragement, I get around that person, it just rises up in them. It's almost like it, it just, it just, you can't help it. When you drive by that guy on the street holding up a sign, and you know, you're like, ah, what if they spend it somewhere else? What if they don't do what? But in, inside of you, there's just something in you like, well, I can't not do something to help him. To help them. It's just something that cries out in you. And you're like, I got to do something. When you see injustice, you got to say, no, 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 I can't stand for that. I can't stand for that. I don't know why. I know it's going to make complicate things when I stand against it. But there's something in me that just rises up, and I can't stand for that. It's a calling. It's a pursuing. There's a gift in you that's calling out. What is your passion? What is your purpose? What keeps you up at night crying in your pillow saying, God, Why? Maybe it's excellence. Maybe excellence is something that cries out to you. I know, I know for me, it, ag- it aggravates me. It aggravates me a whole lot. I heard a preacher say a long time ago, you know what you're called? The very thing that aggravates you the most is probably what you've been called to. And I can't go into a restroom, y'all, in a public restroom. And if there's paper towels laying all over the trash can, the excellence, I, I don't know why. I don't want to do it. I get mad at God. I get mad at myself. Why am I doing this? I don't understand why. I got, and I'll go over and grab paper towel and pick them up and throw them away because there's just something in me just like, ah, what do I got to do this? I don't even work here. But something in me, I know, and I got to wash my hands again. It's a whole deal. It takes way too long and it's, it's aggravating. 
But what calls out to you when you see it? And, and you, there, there's something there. Maybe, well, I'm not a preacher. I can't get up on a mic. I'm not talking about just that. This is something deeper than just what we do on the outside. What if what is calling out to you? Maybe it's maybe it's you're you're called to be a teacher. You love you love little children, and every time you're around them, your heart breaks for little children to make them their life better and to encourage them. It's calling out to you every time you get around. Maybe it's a, a older adults. Maybe it's with you. Whatever it is, it's calling out to you. I gotta help people. I want to be a giver. I want to fund the kingdom of God. I, I don't want, might not be able to speak much. Might not be able to work much. But you know what? I got a little bit of a change in my pocket, and I want to support something. Maybe that's why. I, I, I want to be known as a generous person. That's something, a burden inside of Whatever it is, what is calling out to you have to recognize it. Recognize it. Am I pe- preaching too passionate on a Sunday morning? Paul tells Timothy, Timothy recognize that this isn't in your situation changing or some sort of form of outward help or an answer from somewhere else, it is in you. This idea, this purpose, this song, this, 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 this word, this, uh, this business, this grit, this tenacity, this fortitude, this faith is already inside of you. I feel, I, I feel that in the spirit realm to say that I know I'm, I'm on it, but I feel like some of you are arguing with God right now. Because you're basing it on your situation. It's in you. Here's the reality. God doesn't create anyone that he doesn't put something significant inside of them. Significant inside of them. Let me speak to our younger crowd in here. The, the, The culture of today will tell our younger teens and our, our young adults, they'll tell them, if you don't have this type of talent, or if you don't look this certain way, or if you don't come from this type of background, or if you don't have these kind of opportunities, you're not very significant. And I want you to know God has put significance inside of you. Let me talk to the older crowd in the room. You might say, well, I've lived my life. I've done all I can do. I've missed my moment. I've given, I ain't got much life left. I don't have anything going on. No, no, no. God has put something significant inside of you, and you can do something for the kingdom of God. (laughs) Timothy, you've got to recognize it is in you. He goes on to tell Timothy next. So we got to recognize, and he tells him, you have to Remind. Timothy, you got to remind. Verses 5 and 6, it says, when I call to remembrance. Therefore, he says it later on, therefore I remind you, Timothy. See, memory is so powerful. Memory is something so powerful. It's one of the most powerful senses that we have. I mean, you can, you can, you can smell something. I mean, it takes you back right then, Right? How many used to wear Curve in the room? Anybody wearing some Curve and cool water? I'm dating myself a little bit, but I got a little, I got a little bottle of Curve cologne. that I have, I have a little small bottle still in my, in my little closet, and I, every once in a while I just spray it out and go, ah, 16, first vehicle. <laughs> you hear a song, and it can take you back to a moment in time. You taste something good, and like, wait a minute, how'd you know my grandma? You put it just like grandma made it. Memory is something powerful that God put inside of us. And Paul tells Timothy, Timmy, you have to remember. You got to look, look, when I call back to remembrance, I want you to, to remember, Timothy, that day that I laid my hands on you and prayed for you and how you felt. Remember, Timothy, you want to stir up the gift inside of you? You want to stir up the gift inside of you when you're going through the problems? you got to recognize it's in you. But, Timothy, you got to remember. you got to remember what God has done for you. I remember this uh, story of this uh, older couple. They, um, they were having problems remi- remembering things, and they went to the doctor. The doctor said, you know what, I'm putting Post-it notes up. Maybe that will help you. That will help you with your memory. So that evening, the, the wife, the husband sitting in the living room, she goes, honey, will you do something for me? Will you go make me a bowl of ice cream? And, and if you would, just write a note down in case you forget it. And, of course, like most men in that season of life, like, I don't need no post-it note. I, I got this. I got this. He goes, well, okay, okay, well, you put some strawberries and cream in it as well. So he goes, oh, I got it. I got it. You ain't going to say it again. 
ice cream, strawberries, cream. This ain't that hard. I can do it. Gets up, goes to the kitchen. About 10 minutes later, I mean, pots, pans, banging, stuff going around all over the kitchen, like chaos in there. He comes back out, big old plate of bacon and eggs, hands it to her. She's looking at him, looking down at the eggs, confused. She said, where's my toast I asked for? Here's the thing. The way you remember is the way you live out your future. The way you remember is the way you live out your future, whether good or bad, whether successful or unsuccessful, with, whether full of courage or full of fear, that's the way you live out your future. Paul says, remember what God has done in you and to you. Sometimes you just got to make up in your mind. Look, I understand that your past may be very close to your present. But if you're not careful, you'll live out your future basing everything on what has happened to you that is affecting your family negatively, your value, your perspective of life, of God. And you got to come up and make a decision in your mind, I'm not memorizing my past pain. That's a good place to clap. I'm not saying that you don't even realize that there's, there's something does happen. We have history, and there's things that happen in our history. But there's a difference when people keep reminding their past like it's their present and expecting it like it's their future. You've got to make up a decision in your mind and say, I am not memorizing my past pain of the year. I'm going to remember my purpose. My purpose i got to speed up here, but remember, remember, remember means to bring back together. So I need to remember myself with his word. I need to remember myself with the calling that he's put on my life. I need to remember myself with the purpose and the plan and those moments when God laid, I felt his presence at an altar or when someone came up and gave me a word and it spoke to my heart. I need to remember those moments when the pressure is on. Because here's why. When we remember what God has done, we will be invited to believe what God will do. Will do. It's, it's what Jesus called childlike faith. Remember when the children were all around him and they were, they were, the disciples thought they were bugging him and he's like, no, 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 no. You need to be like these children and have childlike faith. Like I, I can talk to my daughter who's five and if I tell her that I am stronger than a bear, and I can whip a bear with my bare hands, she will go to every person around and say, my daddy's really strong and he can, he can beat up a bear. When's the last time God has told you something and you went, yes. The way we remember is the way we will live out our future. And I want to encourage you today, and I want to give you a permission today to invite yourself to believe God again. Come on, Timothy. Come on, Timothy. Believe again. As I'm getting ready to close, I get, I get three of them. This is my first one. Here we go. He says, you have to do something, Timothy. You got to recognize, you got to remind yourself, and you have to respond. Verse 6 said, stir up the gift. Timothy, you have to stir up the gift. You, Timothy, have to stir up the gift. It is your responsibility. You have to respond. It is your responsibility to stir it up. I know we're like, come on, preacher, make me feel good. Come on, worship team, sing my favorite song. And there's nothing wrong with make, having preachers make you feel encouraged and feeling good and a good song that you can sing to. But what happens when there's no choir behind you in the middle of your circumstance? Or do you have the fortitude to say, I'm going to stir myself up? I'm going to stir it up. See, it is our response 
to his ability. That is your responsibility. It's our response to his ability. You have to do something with the gift that's in you. Stir up inside of you that passion. Stir up that side of you, that energy. Stir up the, inside of you the power to serve God. That's why he said he didn't give you a spirit of fear, Timothy. You have a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. Stir it up. Stir it up. How do I stir it up? I remember. How do I stir it up? I first recognize I got to stir it up. I got to engage myself. I got to push myself to know that no matter what it feels like, God is still good and his callings and his giftings are without repentance and, and he's put inside of me everything I need to get through anything I'm going through to fulfill his will. Don't let the gift of God die within you. When he puts some gift inside of you, you have to respond to it. When we go to heaven and we stand before God, he's not going to look at us, Mike, and go, did you feel the goosebumps in service? Did you, did you, did you do 24 Hail Marys all the time? Did, did you pray in tongues and run around the room? He ain't going to ask us. You know what he's going to say? Jake, he's going to say, what did you do with the gift I put inside of you? What did you do with it? How did you promote the kingdom that I put inside of you? Don't let it sit dormant. Rekindle. That was my second closing. Here we go. Paul's specifically talking about fire, but I thought to be courteous to Pastor Brian and Jesse, I didn't want to shoot pyrotechnics into the air for an example and burn half, down, half the building down before they get back from Israel. So I'm going to do something we can all understand. Stirring, right? Stir the gift up, right? And here's the thing. I want to ask a question. Because the scripture says, every man's been given a measure and God's already put inside of you, right? He put inside of you everything that you need. Everything you need is inside, right? He's deposited inside of you everything that you need. But let me ask this question. What would happen in this church, his church, if the youth group and the youth of this, of this church would just stir it up I mean we're, we're reading about anybody reading about the Asbury revival that's happened things are happening all over different campuses and I love I love it because I've read a lot about it and know people that's been to it and and I love that they're keeping it very simple they're not letting it be celebrity driven you know or, or you know they didn't even let Fox News come out and do a, a spill on it they just said no we're just thank you but no and it's being student led and it's just literally people stirring up stirring up but can you imagine if your youth group here stirred up the gift imagine what his church would be if you stirred up the gift hey imagine what your family would be like if you stirred up the gift I imagine what kind of marriage you would have if you were able to stir the gift of God inside of you towards your husband or wife. I know some people think, well, you know, once my situation changes, then, then I, I have something to stir. But Paul said, no, it's already in you, Timothy. Maybe maybe you're thinking, oh, when, when, when I get all my bills paid, when I get everything ready, then, then, I'll, then I'll have enough in me to give and be a, be a good tither or be a good giver. No, no, Paul said, it's already in you. Well, maybe, maybe when, you know, maybe when I can get healthy enough, I can put that bathing suit on. <laughs> yeah, that. Maybe when, you know, if I, when I get the right education and I understand the Bible more, then maybe I'll step out into my calling. But no, Timothy, it's already in you. Maybe when the Cowboys start winning again, I can have my joy back. <laughs> It's already in you, Timothy. It's already in you, Timothy. It's already put inside of you. Don't wait for your circumstance to change. It's in you. But here's the thing. I told you that even though it's in there, there were, there's instructions to how to deal with this. Recognize, remember, stir it up. Recognize, remember, to stir it up. 
And if you read the directions, and, and you got directions, that's, what's, that's what the Bible is, it's directions. It's to help you with life. So let's just look at the directions. And I'm not that old, so I don't have to do the trombone thing. I don't have to. Ah, it says, just add water. I'm just going to add a little bit of worship to the gift inside of me. I'm going to add just a little bit of a praise to the gift inside of me. I, I'm going to just take a little bit of time and I'm going to honor God where honors do. And I'm just going to give like he asked me to give. I'm, I'm going to lift my hands. Maybe I feel awkward. I've never lifted my hands before in church. But you know what? I'm going to take this time and step out in faith. And I'm just going to water that gift that's inside of me. I'm going to take and let the Holy Spirit direct me. And I'm just going to keep watering that gift inside of me. I'm going to let him correct me and tell me where I need to change in my life. I'm going to let him in inspire me to go out and talk to that person I didn't want to talk to before because I'm embarrassed because I've never done this before. But you know what? I'm going to let you lead me, Holy Spirit. I'm going to let your spirit engulf everything and saturate all that's inside of me. And that way I can have something to stir up my gift with that I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep remembering how God saved my life, how he got me off of addiction, how he's called me and anointed me to do something good. I'm going to recognize it's not in my situation changing. I'm going to recognize and store up this gift inside of me. Why? Because the Bible said, just like Paul says in just a few chapters over in 2 Timothy, he said, my life has been poured out. The purpose of you stirring the gift is so that the nation and the people around you and your family and that co-worker and that person at school that needs what you have inside of you, that you can be good enough and stirred up enough that you're willing to just pour out the good that God has given you. And look what happens. And look what happens. And look what happens. And we just keep stirring and we keep stirring and we keep stirring and we keep stirring until something changes in our community, until something changes in our home, until something changes in our church, until something changes in our culture, until something changes where we live. Timothy. I mean, is it hitting you like it's hitting me? Paul was waiting on his execution, and he had enough in him to pour it out and say, Timothy, stir up the gift. I feel his presence in here. The last few years has been tough for everybody. But I believe today I'm in a room with some people who says, no more. I'm not memorizing my pain. I'm not memorizing. I'm not joining myself to what was and what happened and what experience I've had. Well, if I'm going to join myself to anything, I'm going to remember what Jesus has done for me. Amen. It's time to stir up the gift. Don't wait around and say, God, use me if you can. No, no, you have to take the initiative. You got to say yes. You got to join a group. You got to help on, a, on some team in the church. You got to go out. You still got to walk to someone and say, do you know Jesus? Whatever it is, there's still, there's still an action that has to come. And it still needs And don't be timid, Timothy. Don't step back. Don't step back because it doesn't look culturally cool. It doesn't look like you, what, you know, you think, I'm just a freak. I'm just some weirdo spiritual person. No, 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 Timothy. Don't you, don't you trail back because persecution's coming. You need to stir up the gift. Well, I just got to wait till the anointing hits my life and then I can do it. No, 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 no. This is a faith thing. This ain't a feeling thing. And I, you don't get up and do something because you always feel it. It's great when the choir's here. It's great when the preacher's saying, hoorah, let's go. But don't, don't you wait on those things. Sometimes you just got to make the decision. You got to make the decision to forgive. You got to make the decision to get over it. You got to make the decision and stir up the gift inside of you. Because what got you here does not have to keep you here. You can stir it up. Won't you stand to your feet today? And it's okay, everybody. It's okay, everybody. You're not drinking the Kool-Aid today. It's pretty sweet Kool-Aid. It'd probably come out like syrup. Today, I don't know what kind of pit you're in. I don't know what kind of prison. You may not be in a physical prison like Paul was sitting in, but where you're sitting in life, 
you may feel or even smell what waste is around you. What is wasted around you and it's a constant reminder to you of why you can't. But I want to give you an opportunity to believe again in God, like childlike faith. If God said whatever I've told you in the past, if he showed up right now, if he spoke to you in this service right now and said, I'll give it to you if you just believe, would you believe it? If he shows up right now and he looks at you, if he speaks to your heart and says, just trust me again, I promise you it's coming, would you believe it? Come on, somebody, stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Timothy, stir up the gift inside of you. There's something that someone needs, and only you can provide it. Stir it up. Stir it up. They're going to get it, continue to worship here in a moment, but I want to pray. God, I thank you right now in this room. God, as we begin to worship here, when we begin to cry out that we build our life on who you are and what you've done for us, every person under the sound of my voice that is dealing with rejection, that is dealing with insecurities that seem to overtake every action that they have in their life. Every person, the enemy has tormented their mind to tell them they are nothing, they are not worth anything. I command you to shut your mouth in the mighty name of Jesus, and I stir up the gift inside of you. Lord, right now we lift our hands in this room in honor of who you are. And as we begin to worship, God, do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. What my preaching could not do, if I wasn't clear enough, God, you can do it right now. You can do it right now, Lord. Move, move, move our hearts back to you, to our first love. We stir it up today. Come on. church. Maybe you need to get out of your seat and come down and just a sign of faith. I'm stepping back into my destiny. I'm stepping back into my purpose. Whatever it is, lift it up. Come on, believe again. Fan it into flame. 